Good morning, good afternoon or evening, depending on your time zone in this virtual conference. My name is David Smith and I'm from Limoges, France. I would like to thank the organisers of the symposium for giving me the opportunity to talk about ceramics and computing, which is how I have transcribed the original title given by the organisers. I will touch on most of these terms, modelling, informatics, machine learning and computational material science. My outline is to start with some history of ceramics and computing. Then we're going to look at instrumentation, modeling of sintered ceramics and models for behavior during processing. So we were going, we're going to see how computing has entered all these domains. Then we will finish with some prospects in process control and machine, le machine learning before our conclusion. The next three slides were bar borrowed from Anne Lariche, who was the former European Ceramic Society president. Civilization, with an associated population growth, has developed with advances in materials. We have learned how to transform and use stone, with cutting tools, wood, for example, spears, clay, glass and metals through prehistory, the Bronze and Iron Ages. More recent developments include plastics, semiconductors and advanced ceramics. The history of ceramics goes back to more than 29,000 years ago. It spans from the time when clay figurines were fired in primitive kilns at about 700 degrees, like the Venus found in Dolnice Vecdenice in Slovakia, to now high quality silicon carbide employed in telescope mirrors for astronomy. In more detail, ceramics have evolved from earthenware building materials to the traditional ceramic industry of the 19th century, of uh, fine tableware in porcelain, for example. And now in the last 150 years, the multiple niche applications of advanced ceramics, such as spark plugs, ceramic capacitors, oxygen sensors, and lasers, just to cite a few. How about historical developments for computing? The first important step was the invention of an abacus for arithmetic in Babylonia 4,500 years ago, no doubt for commerce and collecting taxes. The notion of binary numbers can be traced back to over 2,000 years ago in India. Then in the 17th century, methods and, devi and devices for Calculations were developed, such as logarithms by Napier in Scotland, the slide rule, and mechanical calculators became widespread in Europe. If calculation is an important aspect of a computer, memory is also a vital component. Thus information was stored in pun on punched cards as a concept in the 19th century. The next step was the development by Berta of an AND logic gate, where the output depends on the input on information. So this idea leads to the currently used NAND and NOR gates in logic circuitry. Just after the Second World War, Van Neumann introduced the concept of a stored program. Then there was the development of the transistor at Bell Labs as another crucial step. In 1948, IBM brought out an early computer, which was called a Selective Sequence Electronic Calculator, which was based on vacuum tubes and had 23,000 relays, so quite a machine. If early computers were based on vacuum tubes, they were soon to be replaced by silicon integrated circuits with multiple transistors developed, for example, by Fairchild Semiconductor. 
memory is a crucial aspect of a computer for storing information and this has seen continuous development through magnetic based devices such as reels of tape, floppy disks, compact disks and now hard disks. The emergence of the personal computer in the 70s and the 80s on the desk of the scientist and the engineer was a really important step. What about the contribution of ceramics to computers? If one takes Kingery's rather wide definition of a ceramic as an inorganic non-metallic material, one could argue that silicon is a ceramic. Even if we attribute silicon to the electronics industry, uh, we should find various bits of ceramic inside a computer such as insulation, insulating layers, capacitors, memory devices, and especially screens made of glass. However, our contribution of the ceramics community to computers has been wider than that. This is what I learned as a graduate student at Queen's University in Canada in the early 80s. The microcomputer is composed of a central processing unit plus read-only memory, random access memory, and various buses which are connected to the input-output ports, which can then talk to input-output devices. Well, the ceramics community contributed the concept of read-only memory over 5,000 years ago in the form of clay tablets for recording tax information in early Sumerian cities. Well, that is, that's for fun. But we see how important concepts can be found in neighbouring domains of technology. How about the reverse, the reverse relation on the effect of computing on ceramics? I'm going to start with instrumentation for ceramic science. One can, one can consider the laboratory-made equipment or we can also consider commercially available instruments. As a first example, I'm going to uh, talk about some work I did 40 years ago uh, on fast iron conduction in beta alumina. So this was my MSC, MSC thesis at Queen's University. Incidentally, my thesis was typewritten at that time, but when I got round to my PhD, this was written with a word processing pa package. Anyway, my one of my important tasks in this work was the automation of AC impedance measurements for beta alumina with a PET computer and an interface board of microprocessors. Here is a block diagram of the experimental setup. So we can see that the interface board is linked to the PET computer via a data bus. And then it talks, it talked to a waveform generator, a gain phase meter to make the measurements and a temperature controller to set the, the temperature of the oven in which our sample was placed. So all this was driven with a control and data acquisition program written in basic. This gave us a, a screen output in real time of the impedance diagram, which was very useful to see whether the experiment was working well. Here's the, an example of an impedance diagram for blocking electrodes of gold on potassium beta alumina. Another more recent example comes from my research group uh, in Limoges, led by Benoit Nathalie, which is working on drying behavior of green bodies. One method of characterization that's important in drying is to simultaneously measure mass of the sample and dimension, which is traditionally done with uh, LVDT sensors. But We've been looking at doing this with optical cameras so that we can get information in two dimensions. Here we can see that the sample has been marked with black dots and these are followed 
by the camera during the experiment. So we have a computer program which is written in Python which evaluates the distance between these dots um, as a function of time. So it crops the image first and then it works out the contours of the dots and then the distance between these dots. So as an example here, we can see that there are two phases in drying. A first phase where there is shrinkage and then when the, the green body has become rigid, we then have a, a second phase where water is still being taken out of the sample, but the sample is no longer evolving in dimension. Here in this slide, uh, the two methods are compared for Carlin ceramic, which, is, which has anisotropic shrinkage. You can see that uh, this is well registered with the 2D optical method, but with one experiment. Uh, this anisotropic shrinkage can be explained by the preferential orientation of Carlin platelets, which gives different numbers of water layers according to the direction. And then in this final micrograph, we can see that uh, the Carlin platelets are indeed uh, preferentially oriented. A third example uh, that I would like to consider is, well, if we look inside the laboratory, uh, we will find lots of different characterization instruments like thermal analysis, uh, electron microscopes, X-ray diffraction equipment, thermal conductivity equipment. All of them uh, will have a program, a computer program, a computer and a computer program to drive them and also to help the data acquisition and analysis. So here I've put up a definition of Confirmatics, which uh, is representation, processing, and communication of information in natural and engineered systems, or if you like, how we live in the digital space. Well, what we can say is that computers have become an indispensable tool for instrumentation. I now want to look at modeling of synthetic ceramics, definitely computational material science. Models are made at different scales the atomic scale, the grain and pore scale, or even the macroscopic scale for general behavior. Either one scale is going to dominate or else we have to handle in some way scale changes. So here are a few examples which we're going to explore. Olivier Masson's group in Limoges um, are specialists in making atomic scale models. They use in particular X-ray total scattering analysis to get the atomic pair distribution function. And then they're able to do density functional theory calculations to make a model of the structure. So they've been working on tellurium oxide glasses, zirconia nanocrystals and disordered lanthanum silicates. We're going to focus in briefly on lanthanum silicate. The interest of their approach is uh, for ionic conduction and to predict the conduction pathways, and in particular, what activation energy the ionic conduction would have. So this is oxygen ions and uh, with potential for fuel cells. In my second example, I want to illustrate um, modeling done at the grain scale, at different scales. So the homogenization technique. This is the case of zirconia ceramic with two different grain sizes and pores. We can see this in the micrograph. So there's a representation uh, of this in the first schematic of the microstructure. Then in terms of a representative volume element, we'd have a first stage where we calculate the solid phase thermal conductivity, taking an average value over the small grain and large grain regions. And then this is combined in a second step where we take the solid phase thermal conductivity and combine it with that of the pores. And so this will give us an overall thermal conductivity. 
in another example concerned with mechanical properties, um, Marc Ouget's group has been looking at the complex microstructures of refractories. In this particular case, we have a mixture of solid phases. And because of the difference in thermal expansion coefficients, cracking and deponding can occur. The approach has been to simplify the system and to use a model material. So in this case, it's a mixture of alumina inclusions in a glass matrix, where the glass matrix can be chosen with different thermal expansion coefficients. In particular, Damien Andre has been car carrying, carrying out um, discrete element calculations on the system. So in a first case, he's, he's got the uh, thermal expansion coefficient for the matrix, which is stronger than that of the inclusions. And if we look at the simulation, we can see that microcracking occurs. In the reverse case, where the matrix thermal expansion coefficient is less than that in the inclusions, the effect is different. And what we now get is debonding, so space between the alumina inclusion and the matrix. My final example in this section is from the work of Woody Papp's group in Prague on thermal and mechanical properties. After a lot of work on porous ceramics, they have been looking at partially sintered ceramics. In essence, the microstructures of these partially sintered ceramics reveal rounded or convex grains and concave pores. Well-known analytical models for thermal conductivity of the porous ceramic are based on convex pores such as the Hashen-Strickman upper bound, or equivalent to the max leuchten relation. But experimental data on the partially sintered ceramics yield values in green beneath these predictions. So with this group have been using the Geodict software package to explore the effect of concave pores on the thermal conductivity. Their predictions are distinctly beneath those of the standard analytical relations and consistent with the experimental data. So the previous set of examples show how refined computer models of ceramics with stable microstructures can be. The next challenge is to look at green body behavior during processing. The important point is that after forming, the microstructure evolves as we go through elimination of binders or water, formation of particle-particle contacts, densification and grain growth. We're going to look at two different examples, one on drying and one on sintering. The drying of a wet green body involves at least two stages. The first stage, known as the constant rate period, involves significant shrinkage as water is evaporated from the surface of the sample. Then the drying rate slows down as water is extracted from deeper and deeper in the body. In terms of modeling, one has to solve uh, at least two different, uh, two partial differential equations. One, a heat transfer equation, which is coupled to mass transfer. But there is a further complica complication, and that is, that the physical parameters in, uh, which are found in these equations, like thermal conductivity, uh, diffusivity of the water, activity, vary with the water amount. Here we can see for alumina the variation of thermal conductivity with moisture content, quite dramatic. So the model has to update these parameters in the calculations 
uh, as we go through the, the loss of water. And here you can see that uh, on the basis of a finite element model um, in our organigram, how these physical properties are updated. By doing this, the computer model based on finite elements can predict the drying rate and also the surface temperature as a function of time. These predictions have been compared to experiment and are quite good. However, this is a work in progress because ideally one wants to get information on internal stress in the body as well. So this would be the next challenge. Another example of obvious interest is sintering behavior. Friedrich Rather's uh, group in the Fraunhofer at Bayreuth have been working on computer models for some time. Their math methodology has been to combine experiment with finite element calculations to predict final shape of the ceramic. In particular, they have been able to develop uh, in situ measurements by optical dilatometry and thermal diffusivity. By calculating the temperature field, they can then calculate the local densification of the ceramic in a continuum sintering model and this has application to complex shapes and even stress calculations have been performed. So this has been used for the optimization of firing of high voltage insulators and the study has uh, led to a reduced firing time and hence reduced costs. Just to finish up, I want to mention two domains with prospects for the future. The two studies of green bodies were made in the laboratory. Ideally, one wants to extend the approach to industry. Already computers are used for fine control of processing equipment. An example is setting the temperature profile in a tunnel kiln. The next step will be to input data on the state of the green body for feedback control during the process via a real-time computer model, a definite challenge. The other topic of high current interest is machine learning. The algorithm teaches itself to execute its task better. No doubt smaller problems or challenges will be tackled first to gain experience and confidence before more widespread use. However, I give three examples of use or potential use. Formulation of complex materials with a specific function, image analysis, optimization of contrast to reveal the features for analysis, and handling the large amounts of available data on a given process for post-mortem analysis, data mining. So as a conclusion, rather than list the different aspects of this talk, I'm going to use a citation that Willie Papps used in one of his talks. All models are wrong, some are useful. This comes from George Edward Pelham Box. If we paraphrase that, we could say, all computer tools and models have limitations, many are useful. Thank you very much.